we have today with us, we have uh, four other people, volunteers, uh, study the chapters and, 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 and share, share with you guys among me. So um, today we have, let me see, today we have, uh, let, let me introduce the chapter leads first. We have Ru, Janice, Vijay, uh, Malik and myself. Let's start with Ru. Ru, can you uh, introduce yourself to everyone? Sure. Yeah. Hi guys, I'm Ru here. I live in Singapore and I'm a software engineer from Palo IT. And uh, I think I can assume that the common denominator amongst all of us is uh, that all of us have worked with Stanley. And I've worked with Stanley uh, at MOM. Uh, that's my client uh, at the moment. And uh, he has been my mentor all this while. That's it for me. Thank you. Next, uh, Janice. Hi, so I, yeah, same as Ru, we met Stanley somewhere along our journey. And then I'm a software engineer at GovTech and I like to do latte art in my free time. So now that we're all stuck at home, it's quite hard to do latte art. So I'll try to figure a way out to foam the milk. <laughs> yes, first you need to get a machine. <laughs> yeah, Stanley keeps trying to get me to buy a machine. So I will try. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thank Janice. Janice is the sec uh, second time volunteering for, for this. Uh, she's also in the part one, um, part one uh, events as well. Next, we have Vijay. Hi, my name is Vijay and I'm a solutions architect working for one of the logistics company in Singapore. And I know Stanley via Meetup only. So I became a part of uh, his team when he first opened this uh, group. So that's how I know Stanley. And this is the second time I'm partnering with him on this session. It's the first one went on very well. So let's see the second one. Hope it will also go very well, quite well. Nice to meet you all. Thank you, Vijay. Next we have Malik. Hi everyone. So I'm Malik. Uh, I'm a software engineer from GovTech uh, GDS. And yeah, I mean, currently with the work from home situation, I find that my Netflix addiction has exponentially increased. So mm -hmm. That's a first world problem I need to deal with. So uh, I've known Stanley through meetups, uh, attended his Scrum developer course, and also uh, he's my software development coach. So looking forward to go, uh, go through the chapter. Cool, thank you very much. Right, without further ado, let's see. Today's agenda, we have quite a lot of chapters, one more chapter than last time. Um, so now it's seven thirty six. We last time we said that we will we will wrap up in one hour's time, but at the end we ended up one one hour and 30, 30 minutes. Uh, this time I think we might do the same. So we will be wrap, wrapping up around probably nine o'clock. So uh, for each chapter, each of us will share, present, and then uh, we try to keep it under ten minutes. Um, I realized that for the chapter five to nine is pretty intensive. Um, at any point in time, if you have any um, any thoughts that you want to share, or comments, or or what uh, questions, please use the Zoom group chat to to share to share your thoughts. Uh, what this helps us for the presenters is get a sense of you know, how are we doing. You know, are we are we connecting with you? Or, or we are really far, far off. So uh, we will try for every end of the chapter uh, to stop, pause to see if there's any questions to answer uh, before we continue to the other chapter. And because of the time constraint, we may only cover at most uh, one question before we proceed to the next chapter. So this will be something that's a, a refinement from, a, from a, the last, from the part one uh, events. Uh, and we'll see how, how this goes. So what we'll cover for each of the chapter, uh, we share a bit, a few highlights. Some chapters are pretty intense. There are a lot of topics. Uh, so we might only share a couple of it. And then also share what in the chapter resonates with uh, us who is, who is studying the, the chapter. Uh, a caution on advices. Any, there'll be a lot of advice in this book. 
any advice can be taken to extremes or used inappropriately. So one of the um, uh, advice on advice from a book is that um, uh, be aware you know, if you are if you're getting to taking the advice to the extreme, uh, be conscious, conscious of it yourself. And uh, maybe when you become aware of that, uh, it's time to understand more about uh, the advice uh, in deeper context or in, in deeper manner. Okay. Cover this. So uh, very quickly run through on, on uh, what we kept on the part one. Uh, let me take a look. Okay. So in part one, we, we, what led to this book, uh, the authors, Dave Thomas, the Paralactic Dave, and Andy Hans, they were consultants in the past and they worked with many projects. Um, in many cases, they, um, they found themselves asking the same questions and advice over and over again. So they note down those, those uh, advice and, and, and situations. And this book is the result of that. And um, over, over 20 years now, uh, this is the 20th uh, of anniversary, uh, they found that a lot of the practices and approach that is taught 20 years ago in that book um, is still useful in many people, for many people. So they decided to update this book with uh, one third of new chapters, uh, technologies are updated as well. Uh, hopefully this 20 year anniversary can last for another few decades. So in chapter one, uh, they talk about uh, taking responsibility as a developer. Uh, they also talk about how software can grow rot and uh, the, the term about technical debt. They also encourage developers to, programmers to, uh, to see, mm, to, to be aware of the knowledge portfolio they have. Uh, they use financial portfolios advice like uh, invest regularly, like uh, uh, learn a new language, programming language every year, uh, read a new a technical book every, every month, uh, things like that. They give tips about this on how to build up your portfolio. And also uh, something about how to build good enough software. In chapter two, Pragmatic approach, they talk about the dry principle, the don't repeat yourself. They also talk about uh, tracer bullets, you know, how to get a quick feedback, uh, cutting across the, the whole stack of your, your application and to see how actually uh, each of the parts, the layers work. Um, uh, they also talk about no decisions are, are final, um, not assuming that decisions that we make are final because, uh, late, because future is uncertain. There will be future circumstances that will change what we used to what we used to decide. So, uh, no point uh, assuming that the decisions we make now are final and it will be it will be, it will be lasting. Chapter three, they talk about some of the basic tools. They advocate that developers or programmers should understand your editor shortcuts, keyboards well, use of shell, and um, think debugging as a problem solving uh, perspective instead of someone to blame. Chapter four, they talk about, uh, they acknowledge that they, uh, we can't write perfect software and we're bound to make mistakes. Uh, what are the some of the strategies that pragmatic programmers can use to protect their own mistakes? Uh, some techniques like design by contract uh, and also avoid fortune telling. This is a very short uh, wrap up from what is from part one. Now proceed to part two. So in part two, uh, this chapter, this chapter is ban or break, ban as in like the brand, uh, flexible ban, break, uh, break, break means break. Um, so in this topic, they talk about decoupling, the importance of decoupling, and they also uh, explain the the concept of coupling. So what, what is coupling? Um, <clears throat> they gave a metaphor, a metaphor of, if you're going to build design, design bridges, you want them to hold their shape and you need them to be rigid. Like the first, let me turn on my pointer. Like this first uh, picture, 
the all the, the the points are connected together so that it is rigid uh, but when we are designing software we that we want to change uh, we want the exact opposite uh, we want it to be flexible and to, to be flexible the individual components should be uh, coupled to as few as other components as possible so it give another the other picture that shows um, there is less uh, rigidity the individual links can change and others just accommodate it um, right. so they also uh, highlight some of the what are some of the symptoms of coupling that, that you find in your work uh, when you discover that uh, there are dependencies the wacky dependencies between unrelated modules or libraries. Um, some simple changes in one module uh, could pro propagate to unrelated modules in the system or break uh, stuff somewhere else. So that's, those are some signs of coupling. Uh, developers who are afraid to change code because they are unsure what might be affected. Um, and also, if you have meetings where everyone has to attend because no one is sure who will be affected by a change, uh, those are these are all signs of coupling or uh, unsure of what are the couplings uh, uh, inside inside of the system. So they they suggest a few techniques to to overcome uh, coupling, and I'm going to only highlight uh, one of it because the this chapter has quite a lot of uh, other topics as well. One of the highlights is a principle is called tell don't ask. Tell means I tell the object to do something instead of, instead of asking information from it. So they show this code called apply discounts uh, method. And in this apply discounts, we have a customer that retrieve uh, a list of orders. And then uh, this method also knows how to find a particular order and try to get the, for that particular order, get the total object out of that order. From this object, I set some values, granddaughter and also discounts on it, and, 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 and that's it. <clears throat> so uh, this breaks the principle, um, breaks this principle, tell, don't ask. It is asking a lot of information in this method and try to do something to it. Um, uh, in, the, in the book, it also, yes. Don't micromanage. So apply this guy is, is trying to micromanage uh, our customers object, orders, and also total. And it's a, it's a train wreck. That's, that's what it says in the, in the book. What can we do? So we could you know, think about getting back to this code. Do we need, in this code, do we need to know um, how to reach, how to find the particular order ID? Uh, probably not. So we could actually encapsulate or hide that logic into a customer class. And then uh, it now says customer.findOrder. And then um, if we go back here about get totals, we get total and then we try to set it, set the discounts to it. Uh, do we need to know this detail over here? Um, we could actually just tell it by, by pushing that responsibility to the total object to apply the discount directly. So um, this improves more telling and less asking. So can, we can ask a question, do we want, uh, is this sufficient or do we still continue more because it is asking for some of the, the totals as well? We could go further by hiding the totals from apply discounts. Um, so uh, now it reads like this. And then um, the author says that no, this is where we probably would stop. Um, you may think that tell don't ask will make us add an additional uh, method call like uh, apply discount to order, the whole thing to the customers. Uh, if we follow that slavishly, um, uh, it, it would, but no, tell don't ask is not a law of nature. It is just a ha pattern to help us to recognize uh, problems. So uh, it went on, I, I, 
I like I love that that quote, um, the the paragraph that uh, follows on to this. So it says, in every application, there are certain top level concepts that are universal. In this application, those concepts include customers and orders. It makes no sense to hide orders totally inside customer objects. They have an existence of their own. So you no, know, there are concepts, contextual details like this allow us to, uh, instead of following, uh, tell them us blindly, but you know, there are certain situations we would actually stop and, and, and know when to stop. Okay. So some other highlights of this, um, this chapter, um, they discourage globalization, especially uh, about globally uh, accessed data. <clears throat> so global data includes singleton and also external resources that could be uh, even your databases. They encourage wrapping the database through an API so that you don't uh, necessarily need to know the database detail. Um, we also talk about uh, programmers uh, are not using enough of, well, uh, uh, lack of, the lack of, the lack of use, use of uh, finite state machines. They, 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 state, they, they were saying that uh, you could use more finite state machines uh, to represent state transitions from, uh, like <clears throat> thinking about workflow application, uh, that could be a good ap application to it. Uh, they also talk about observer pattern. Um, so talk about transforming programming. So th these are the these are the, this few highlights uh, topics or techniques uh, is is trying to uh, talk about the concept of uh, coupling to reduce coupling, um, improve. So transform. Transforming programming, uh, they give an example that um, like Unix commands like this, what you see here is about trying to find the list of all the files and try to uh, show what are the top five files that has the longest lines of, longest number of lines. Uh, transforming programming uh, it also relates to functional programming. When you look at flow of data, transforming from one to the other. They were saying that um, an alternate way of looking, if we think in object-oriented manner, we would think about uh, input data. It needs some, we need to design some classes and objects to, um, uh, to, to, to encapsulate data and so on and so forth. What this does is actually increase coupling. And if we think of um, the data is a flow to be transformed, um, then it actually reduces a lot of coupling a lot uh, because the functions are not depending on the, uh, are not depending on, the functions are, are, are more uh, isolated. They are, they are more independent of each other. So I'm not gonna go through in detail. Um, I would suggest you to take up, pick up this book and, and read further. Uh, it also talks about problems with inheritance and alternatives like uh, prefer interfaces or protocols to express polymorphism, uh, has a over is a, uh, and is also the use of mixins. Let's check the time. Okay, I think that's about it for this chapter. Um, let me take a look. Yeah, good advice to minimize uh, state sharing. Okay, good. Uh, let's follow on to the next chapter. Next chapter would be Ru. Yep, that's me. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's me guys. Okay. Hey. Okay. <laughs> okay, back to normal. So uh yeah, so I've heard a lot about coupling and sharing state. Uh, so I think we have uh, this topic is really gonna cover a lot more of that. So yeah, so this chapter is called concurrency and that everything is concurrent, at least everything that is real uh, in this world will take time. And we have to be pragmatic about how we approach things that take time. Um, let me just, yeah, I can control it. Oh. I'm sorry. 
yeah okay so uh, what was that saying yeah so everything is concurrent and that everything takes time and we have to and that also uh, will reflect in uh, the way we code things because we are coding things that are real uh, real applications uh, real world applications so we have to understand what is uh, concurrency and what is uh, parallel parallelism uh, which is uh, which is a huge difference, which I'll go through in the next uh, few slides, and also uh, talking about coupling. So what uh, Stanley shared was about uh, dependencies of code that are tightly coupled with each other. But in this case, I'm going to uh, dive deeper and talk about uh, breaking temporal coupling, uh, where this includes the concept of time in your code. Next, uh, we'll talk about uh, working with shared state and how it works. Uh, concurrency can be used uh, while working with shared state. Uh, but of course, it's not the perfect solution. So we'll, uh, the book actually suggests some workarounds to, the, uh, to this. And I will go through two of those, which is actors and processes and blackboards. So uh, let's jump right in. Yeah, so let's, uh, before we go uh, any further than this, we have to understand what is the difference between concurrency and parallelism. Uh, concurrency is when you have multiple pieces of code and when they are being executed, they act as if they run at the same time, but they actually don't, as shown by the first image on the left. So you have task A, task B, which are split into uh, smaller tasks. But if you see, uh, in the graph of time, uh, they do uh, take turns to be executed instead of being executed all at the same time versus parallelism where it's the execution of pieces of code where they do run at the same time, where you, in this case, uh, if you speak of a computer, you do have multi cores where, you know, where two processes can run at the same time. So, Concurrency is more of a software problem uh, and parallelism can be solved by adding more and more uh, CPU power to something, to a computer. Moving on. So what is the issue with concurrency? Like why do we face this issue in our day-to-day -day development? Um, firstly, there's a temporal coupling, which may cause a lot of issues in the sense that uh, do we impose a time-based restriction on when we are uh, executing some methods? Do we have to call method A and then call method B? Does tick always have to come before talk? You know, so we have to understand our design because when we are designing applications, we don't think in terms of uh, whether some of the actions can be done at the same time. Uh, but no, we mostly think about, okay, this has to be done, then this, then this, then this. Like when we talk about a sequence diagram, we don't talk about um, maybe some of the tasks can, can be done at the same time. And if one task is taking too long, some of the CPU power can actually be used to process something else. So uh, there's, uh, we sh if we don't make use of this, we will be wasting resources uh, when we do not think about time when we are designing applications. It's not flexible, it's not realistic. And time and time again, we do the same mistake, especially when we do uh, use shared state. Uh, and shared state doesn't only mean uh, like global variables, as Stanley had mentioned. Uh, it's basically a, a reference of a, a state that is being used in multiple places. And many, uh, many resources have access to this state, but again, this could cause a lot of race conditions and uh, reading inconsistent parts of that state. And this is of course very error prone. So uh, the book has actually uh, detailed a very clear example. So I'll go through that example. So let's say we have a restaurant and there are customers in it and there are two waiters and and there's a display of pies. So let's say there's only one pie in the display, but two waiters are tending to two different customers and each customer would like to have a pie. So let's say the waiter one looks at the display and like, hey, I see a pie. So I promise the customer, okay, I will get you that pie. But by then waiter two had already promised his customer the pie and gotten the pie from the pie 
display. And now the waiter one is just uh, stranded and having to apologize to his customer that, okay, I'm sorry, I said I had it, but now I don't. So this is one example of how uh, when you read a shared state, there could be inconsistencies and there are problems uh, that can be caused. People can lose jobs. So, um, so what do we do? So uh, uh, a very natural reaction would be, hey, okay, when I am taking something out of the box, I will lock it. Like, I won't let anyone read it yet. So semaphores, I hope that I'm correct, I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, which is basically a lock. Like when something's happening, I will lock this piece of code and no one else can access the state. So we add a lock before, and once that uh, logic is executed, we will unlock it. But the issue with this is everybody has to agree to lock and unlock. There is a responsibility that's given to people in this case. And at any time, uh, again, uh, to err is to human. So, you know, the locks sometimes may or may not work, or they may just forget to use the locks. So, um, what do we do? We centralize the control in like one place. So we want to, let's say the display case, we want to see if the pie is available. So we get a slice. And if slice, we give it to the customer. Yeah, so uh, because in this case, uh, we will, of course, we want to check, we want to have uh, the display case to be the one that is the sole owner of uh, being uh, sole owner of telling everyone, hey, uh, this is how many pies that I have, like I am the one who holds the truth behind the number of pies. So we are centralizing that control to the display case in this case. So get pie if available is a function that's only, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's owned by the display case. So now, uh, get pie if available is where we check whether if slices of pie is more than zero, then I'll give it or update it to uh, to the customer. But the issue with this again is, so here we are locking it before we check the number of slices. And if there are no slices, we will uh, return it to the display case or we, I mean, nothing will happen. And then we'll unlock this uh, unlock uh, this code piece of code. But then the issue here is the update sales data. If this fails, we will never unlock this uh, the semaphore. It will always there'll be an exception raised. So we need to be able to handle this, right? So what do we do next? We will have to handle exception cases. So how do we handle exception cases? Where we get a lock, we do a try and catch. And no matter what, we ensure that it's unlocked. But again, we don't want, uh, we this whole locking and unlocking process uh, is a lot of uh, commands to remember. So uh, what we do is usually um, a lot of libraries that are out there uh, who deal with locking and unlocking will come uh, out of the box to basically do a do the locking for you. So you don't have to remember that, you know, you have to lock and lock. So in this case, in the second line, it says case underscore seven four uh, dot protect. Yes, I agree. You do and you can end up with a deadlock if you do not uh, correctly uh, deal with locking and unlocking certain things. So, so now we have another problem. What if, so just now we are only dealing with pi. So now we are dealing with pie and ice creams. So uh, this is a picture of uh, what the author had mentioned. It's called pie a la mode. It's a, it's a French dessert. So I didn't know uh, why this pie needed two things, but then I, when I saw the picture, it's like, oh, it needs ice cream too. So there are some customers who want both pie and an ice cream. So now they have to check the display case for the pie and they have to check freezer for the ice cream. And now if both, slice and scoop are available, only then I'll give it to the customer. But what if this is a customer who does not want ice cream on their pie? How is that going to look like? So, so what we can do is 
I'll take a slice, check if it's available. If there's a slice, I will continue to uh, check if I have uh, ice cream available in my freezer. If it doesn't, I will say, okay, I'll give back my pie. I will not. Uh, th this is the case we are talking about where a customer wants both a pie and an ice cream. So in this case, if there's uh, no scoop available, no slice available, we'll just give it back. And if there's a scoop, if there is a, a ice cream, then I will give it to the customer. If not, I will put it back, give back to the freezer. So you can see that it's becoming more and more chunky. There's a lot of ifs, there's a lot of tries, there's uh, nested ifs. So it's starting to get really hard to handle multiple cases, uh, multiple uh, resources, multiple, uh, this is only two and it's already getting pretty chunky, right? So now this is where we come up with solutions on whether we use shared state or not. And the author outrightly says, no, no shared state. You know, why do we keep doing the same thing again and again? Um, and this is a whole new concept that even for me, um, I have not really thought about it. I've also used shared state most of the time. Yes, uh, you know, some of the shared state that we use is immutable, but still it doesn't really uh, completely resolve the whole concurrency issue of race conditions and all that that I've mentioned earlier. So the author proposes two solutions. One is actors, it's an actors model. And uh, the other one is blackboards. So actors, uh, what uh, very simply, they what they do is basically they share no data and they communicate only over channels with uh, defined simple semantics and simple language. And Blackboards is basically a big object store and the only way to talk to it is through a broker or, or a queue and you just update messages or remove messages. I'll go, I'll go through this more in detail. So what is an actor? Actor is a primitive unit of computation. And what it does is it receives a message and it does kind of a, 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 some kind of a computation based on it. But again, you, again, this reminds you of something. It's like, isn't it like an object oriented programming? Isn't it like, you know, we have actors, you know, it has certain set of functions and, you know, uh, once you call a function on it, it updates itself. It sounds like that, but the main, main uh, difference is that actors are completely isolated from each other and they will not share memory and only the actor itself can change its own state. No other actor can change its state. So, so what is it that actors do? One is create more actors, send, other me send messages to other actors and designate what to do with the next message. So this is interesting. So the actor has its own private state. It has its own, in a way, a mailbox, uh, which is only privy to itself. And the mailbox contains a message which the actor has got from the others. The message here is a, is a simple immutable data. And usually these messages, whenever it receives it, it's basically executed in a FIFO manner. And the actor's private state, again, can only be changed by processing a message. If someone else says, hey, do this, and then that actor will continue to do that. So someone else can't di dictate the state of another actor. And uh, what does it mean by designate what to do with the next message? It means that we define how the state will look like when we, uh, when we process, when the actor processes the next message. So this is a, another way of how actors mutate state. So it's, it's immutable, but uh, this is their own way of getting ready for the next message. So yes. So let's see how we can change the whole restaurant example by creating actors. So on your top left, we have customer actor where they have three different uh, messages hungry for pie, that means they want to have a pie. Put on table, that means they see that the pie has been put on their table. No pie left, that means the customer will sulk. And going to the waiter actor below, you can see that uh, the waiter actor can order. Uh, that means they can get you a slice from the pie case. They can add to order, or they can say, hey, I'm sorry, I don't have a pie. Uh, then we go on to the pie case actor 
where it where all it does is okay compute how many pies it has and then uh, eventually does what it needs to do like either say sorry or uh, put on the table or add to order so uh, the initial state of a pie is let's say in this case very simply they have three pies apple peach and cherry for uh, the waiter actor, they basically have a reference of the pie case because they need to check from the pie, hey, how many pies do you have? So that's the initial state for the waiter actor. So now we can start, now customers can start calling like, hey, okay, I want, I'm hungry for pie. So if you see, if you look closely in the dispatch function, there's C1 and C2. So C1 calls us, C2 calls next. C1, then C2, and C1. So it's an alternate C1, C2. Customers who are asking for pie. So the first one, customer asks for, I'm hungry for pie. The waiter will check. They have three pies. They'll give the first uh, customer sees apple pie on the table. So they receive the first apple. And now the pie case is updated to only have peach and cherry. Now C2 asks for another pie. And they'll get the next pie, which is the peach pie. Then the customer one again asks for another one and there's only cherry left. Oh, sorry. Firstly, the waiter adds apple because since the customers are, have the pies on their table, they have to basically add this in the order. So waiter adds apple pie to customer one and uh, waiter adds pie, peach pie to customer two. I missed that out, sorry. Then next customer one sees cherry pie slice appear on the table because uh, they asked for the third one. And now all pies are gone. So next, whoever is asking the last two uh, queries, when they ask, they said, sorry, I have no pie left. And the customer sells. And the last one is, you know, the customer doesn't get anything again. So that's, so if we see uh, that whole uh, process of, do, uh, of turning your, uh, your whole logic of the restaurant example into simple actors. No one shares state, uh, if you go back to it. No one shares uh, each other's state. They all only contain, they all only maintain what they need to know. And in this case, concurrency uh, can be resolved to a, to a large extent. And how was this done? So that code that I've seen was we actually built on this library called NACT. So um, that's the link that, uh, that we have to the GitHub. And basically what it is, is a Redux, but for the backend server. So usually we think of Redux for you know, React or Vue, but uh, we need to also include immutability in our backend when we want to maintain a, a, a lot of resources, a lot of requests coming in. So we need to be able to maintain that. And uh, why do we use this? It's more effective. Uh, we can use this more effectively for memory improve application resilience. Uh, that's what I was talking about for incoming requests. Increase performance uh, because, you know, things are happening concurrently, right? So uh, a lot can be done uh, with uh, fewer resources. And again, it reduces coupling. Uh, there won't be any race conditions on a shared state. And uh, that was JavaScript. So uh, the author did show us uh, a code, the code in JavaScript, but uh, Erlang is the one that it, it's mostly lauded for being built on top of this model, which is uh, actors and processes. So in Erlang, um, you know, they call their actors processes. And it, I mean, this is not the exact process that we talk about in OS. This is a different process. And these processes are very lightweight. Uh, they do a, a single thing at one time. And that's why there, there can be millions of these processes that are running on a machine. And they implement this supervisor worker kind of a model. So if uh, some of the actors um, way below in the hierarchy fails, the supervisor can respawn these processes and say, hey, okay, you're, you're up again. And all this actually uh, builds up the resiliency of the whole system. And Erlang offers hot code reload, so you don't have to rebuild the whole system to view your changes. Uh, uh, so Elixir, Elixir is more of a modern, uh, modern day Erlang. It's built on top of it, so a lot of the basic initial uh, libraries that were built on Erlang is still accessible by Elixir. Um, 
Elixir is a functional program, uh, uh, programming language. It states is immutable. And why is it used? Uh, it's because uh, if you need to grow or scale your application, or rather, when is it used? So in cases where, uh, where you need to grow or scale your applications to know when you know that the service is going to be, you know, expecting millions of customers. Uh, so Elixir can really handle that weight. Uh, handling in, uh, a lot of incoming requests. I mean, it doesn't have to be a lot of incoming requests. It can be few requests, but it could be very resource heavy. So it can generate a lot of high volume in the back end. There's a lot that we need to like churn in terms of uh, computational power. And uh, you and this is of course if you need to build a system with concurrency, this is an amazing language. It's easy to develop. It's easy, it's easy to maintain. And uh, again, the forefront of Elixir and Erlang that their main motto is to keep things simple. So this is something that I think can work for many of us. Okay, so we've spoken about actors which can actually help our case uh, for concurrency. Uh, so uh, this is the next example on how we can process uh, concurrent requests. So uh, this blackboard is basically a form of a more ad hoc, haphazard kind of a concurrency uh, way of dealing with it. Uh, so, so let's say there are a lot of uh, processes, agents, and actors, and they're all independent. So, and they all are working to look at this one blackboard which is this one big object store. So everybody is you know, watching this, updating it, adding things, uh, uh, removing things. And at the end of the day, everybody comes to a conclusion. And uh, the key feature is none of, uh, none of them know each other. Uh, they all have different expertise, disciplines. People can come and go, no restrictions, but people can keep adding and removing things from their blackboard. And all of them wor are working to do this one thing uh, at the end of the day. So there was a blackboard that was built last time. So it stores everything as tuples. And if you want something, you can write to it, you can query it, you can do a sort of a pattern matching with the tuples. But it never really took off because we didn't really need that kind of, uh, uh, there was no requirement to do this, like to do that high level uh, concurrent or cooperative processing. So we didn't need that. But a smaller uh, uh, subset of a blackboard is like messaging queues, where you send messages across to each other. And some of sometimes like Kafka, RabbitMQ, they do persist some data. So uh, it does, in a way, uh, work uh, like a blackboard. So some of the caveats uh, where we work with uh, when we're working with concurrency is yes, we can, uh, you know, use these actor model approach or blackboard approach to basically fix this concurrency issue, but uh, you know it, it comes at a huge cost. It's harder, harder to reason because you don't know what's happening. Some of the actions are called by its sub processes, sub actors, so you never know where uh, the issue may may have gone wrong, right? So uh, there's a central. So you need to have a central repository of messages. You need to make sure there's proper documentation. You need to have proper tooling to make sure you can trace messages back to the whole sequence of uh, activities that has happened. And of course, because it's uh, so many different moving parts, it is very difficult to deploy and manage. So there are some setbacks to this. So what, uh, just to recap in the last slide, it's uh, what, I, what I had gone through today was understanding concurrency versus parallelism. Uh, how we should break out of the whole um, uh, design uh, design pattern, or rather the way we design is we should think about how things can be done at the same time and not sequentially. Um, of course, working with shared state, how is wrong? How are the, what are the workarounds? Some most of them don't really work, and uh, the workarounds are basically uh, the solutions that the author provided was actors and processes and blackboards. So I, this is uh, quite intense and heavy. So uh, I hope you guys uh, were able to catch up with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ru. All right, let's. Vijay, go. go Hi. Yeah. yeah, this is Vijay. My slides are not that graphic. It's all text because it talks about the coding uh, discipline that every developer should have. Basically, if you are a programmer, what kind of things that will go into your brain and what kind of things that you need to do. 
so basically let's start this is the recap of the entire chapter so these are all the bullet points main bullet points that he is talking about and uh, so let's start with the first one coding is not mechanical so obviously uh, developers whoever is uh, working on a piece of code they should be very careful in what they are developing so he has given certain uh, areas of interest where the developers can keep an eye on them so that to become better developers or better coders uh, in whichever language they choose so first one is uh, listen to your lizard brain uh, because normally developers will be very in the new developers are different from professional developers because new developers will have some fear in them whether they may code wrongly or they may uh, someone will point their uh, uh, problems in their code or certain kind of uh, uh, noise is going on into their brain so what uh, the author is saying that uh, listen to those things also so that it will help you to channelize those fears into better coding uh, principles so that you can learn with experience or with mistakes then you can do the things so that's what he's going to explain and also not do uh, programming by coincidence uh, that means uh, don't leave it to chance uh, try to code in such a way that it should uh, actually last longer uh, the best example he has given is uh, a, a radio uh, which is invented in uh, 1970s or 60s uh, but if you buy one piece of a radio it, today also the same fm radio will still work there is no need of uh, code uh, thing so that uh, it will still work means in the sense like it still acts the same thing that is supposed to do that uh, that piece of radio is supposed to do so that's why he says that positively involve in the coding process so that you can build a better code uh, and also try to uh, make the coding uh, jargon the algorithms that you prepare uh, has certain uh, speed that is included in that one so that you can do potential uh, uh, you can identify potential problems early in the coding itself and refactoring of the code uh, continuously fix the existing code that's what is the refactoring we'll see the rest of the things in detail with all these uh, bullet points a test to code uh, when you do testing to the code don't assume the developers will assume that uh, if somebody finds a bug or a defect in their piece of code they think that they are pointing fingers at their competency but uh, the other is saying that don't take the bugs or fixes that comes into the code as a competency issue make sure that it is like a feedback on your code and try to improve on that uh, bugs and defects on your code so that it will make you a better uh, experienced developer kind of a thing similarly what kind of testing you need to do uh, when you do a piece of code whether you take uh, test data what kind of test data you need to take and what are the properties that you need to see all those things will be defined little later and also security that stay safe out there is security uh, how to uh, build a code that is last uh, securely uh, does the thing that is supposed to do and also naming things so don't uh, see the names that you keep it in the code uh, is reflects the way that you code like some developers use xyz or abc as variable names and the author is saying that don't use that uh, vague uh, naming conventions use a proper naming conventions so that whenever a third man reads your code he will understand what is that variable name and what it is going to do and all those things so these are the things that is highlighted in the slide let's go a little bit detail uh, because this is not a, a very graphic uh, things it's all text based uh, suggestions that uh, author is giving to the developers to keep it in mind while they are involved in a project so let's go to the next slide so this is the next slide uh, so when the, uh, the first one is the listen to your lizard brain that is what uh, that is author is talking about your instincts uh, but when you share something it they should not have any words so that means you should keep all your instincts in mind and the mind uh, whatever you have thoughts the thoughts will not have any words you need to come out of the thoughts and put it in some kind of wordings and then you need to code that in the coding that you need to show that in the coding that's what he's saying so while you are starting a new project you will have fears uh, try to overcome those fears and try to face that fears with uh, some tasks so that you can gain experience and wisdom on those uh, fears so similarly errors in your code uh, won't reflect your company that's what the other is saying so not just code is one where you think that you need to just do the coding for the sake of coding you need to do passionately do that coding so that 
uh, it will come up with a lot of uh, uh, what we call uh, uh, by seeing the code itself the other or the reader will assume that how much you can code or how, what kind of coding you have done so that it also avoids problems and it will lead into a quality uh, process so the entire idea of this author is that you need to code by putting actively and by removing all your fears and instance outside that code so that you can put 100% concentration on how you code similarly the other thing that program coincidence uh, programming by coincidence don't leave it to luck so don't assume that you write something that it will work for the system so you need to take into consideration what is the requirements how to code them how it fits into the other pieces of the code all those things has to be taken into consideration while you do coding so that's what uh, try to avoid uh, implementation accidents that's what uh, the author is saying that don't rely on undocumented error or boundary errors uh, close enough isn't uh, close enough that means uh, just because you got an uh, result doesn't mean that you write it very well so that's what the author is pointing that so it should be meaningful the results also should be meaningful for the piece of code that you have written that means you need to take the requirements into consideration you need to write a piece of code which will result in what is expected not by chance just because you don't have any error doesn't mean the program is right that's what he's saying and also don't assume things and then uh, if you are assuming things you have to prove those things with a facts or certain kind of uh, data thing when you're doing the coding and also don't try to fit your answer so sometimes the developers try to su give suggestions that my code is right the other code is wrong so don't get into the habit of uh, just because your program is running well in your machine doesn't mean it will run in different machines uh, the same thing uh, similarly when you give the test data uh, the same thing uh, may not work for a different set of data so you need to make sure that uh, whatever area or whatever test data in which your machine it runs the the context should be uh, the program has to suffice the context that's what he's saying similarly uh, don't assume and uh, because if you assume things then we will move out of the facts so you should be based on the facts you need to code the uh, program or whatever the pro problem that you are trying to solve so implicit assume assumptions or explicit assumptions should be kept outside the purview unless it is driven by well established facts so that's what uh, the author is saying for the is the the entire chapter is like giving guidance or steps for the developers on how to be a better developer or how to be a dev, the programmer kind of a thing so next slide is about algorithms when you write a program you you assume those uh, your program runs in your system very fast and uh, you don't need to worry about uh, other things and also for example he has given one big uh, very good example that just because you process uh, 10 items in a minute uh, doesn't mean uh, it will uh, process 100 uh, items in uh, another uh, 10 minutes itself it may take a lifelong to process those 100 items also so be careful on how you write the code just because uh, 10 uh, items have been processed in one minute 100 all items also will get processed so other is uh, trying to give some examples like how do you do loopings because sometimes developers will unnecessary loop if you have a list of objects the uh, de developer will write the collection of assume that the list of objects are full then you will try to rotate that uh, loop that objects without any proper value to that looping so that means it is unnecessarily taking a cpu calls similarly runtime errors memory errors recursive errors in whatever the programming language you are using you need to have a uh, very uh, cynical eye on uh, uh, how this memory is uh, thing has been allocated to different variables how the recursive recursive is very dangerous in the programming when you do recursive calls uh, if something goes wrong it will go into an infinite loop and it will try to occupy cpu speed and the memory and all those stuff so that's why other is trying to asking the developers um, have a cynical eye on how many loops you are using how many recursive calls you are making whether you are making uh, unnecessary calls if you are making unnecessary calls don't use that one and also check the memory requirement so because you were laptop a developer laptop may have a 8 gb or a 16 gb ram but in production sometimes they may have 2 gb ram also it may not be sufficient uh, to run the program that uh, written in the development box so those kind of examples other has given uh, in written so you can walk through the examples in the textbook so uh once you have a chance of getting the book
similarly you need to have estimations in mind not only coding you need to uh, do the coding in such a way that you need to tell how much time it will take that's why he is given some big o notation uh, that is nothing but uh, how many cycles uh, that are how many how much time the loops will take uh, kind of a thing for example a quick sort is there for example for 100 items it will take uh, just a, a matter of one or two seconds to uh, do the quick sort for 100 objects but the same quick sort if you use it for 1000 it will be taking the same time again one or two seconds only so you need to make sure that uh, you need to come to a logical uh, estimation saying that uh, my ex- my a uh, piece of algorithm or a code will take this much uh, cpu cycles and it will execute uh, for 1000 objects this much time or uh, maybe uh, 100k objects uh, this much time so you should have at least a uh, fact based estimation so that you know how much uh, your core piece of code will run in different uh, cpu or different memory or different environments uh, that's what is algorithm speed this is kind of a suggestions to the developers not only you need to make sure your code runs in your computer make sure that you give some estimates how it runs in different environments also similarly uh, refactoring uh, this is another form of uh, refactoring the best uh, idea he has given is uh, change the internal structure but without changing the external behavior that means you make sure that your uh, code external functionality will not change but internally you can change many things so that's what uh, when should you refactor that is also given suggestions you should refactor when it is there is no du- when there is a duplication in the code when the internal uh, logic is outdated which is not fit for the purpose and also the performance is degrading and some of the test data is not passed through your code so at that time you need to do refactor refactoring is nothing but fixing the code uh, functionality without affecting the overall uh, scope of the uh, program so how do you refactor uh, don't go into big bang uh, approach changes to all the code uh, try to take uh, short changes uh, very minimal changes and uh, and you know what will happen if you do the change and also try to add uh, test cases to the changes so that you you are sure that the external behavior will not change for the piece of code and also try to re, uh, refactor when you are refactoring don't add new functionality to it uh, you take up the new functionality in a new piece of code which will suffice to your uh, new uh, tech, uh, new behavior or new functionality that you are going to do so that is another suggestion that other has given similarly other is concentrating on Uh, some kind of uh, test driven development i just used a graphic which is available on the google page uh, i hope uh, there are so many methodologies for uh, test uh, driven development development methodology like kanban is there extreme programming is there and the test driven program is there behavioral driven uh, design programming is there development is there so these are different methodologies are there but other has chosen uh, test driven development Uh, what he is saying is you write the code to fail that is the, that's why the starting point is here on the red color and write a test case for that so that it fails so that you can make changes to the test case so that the code piece of code will pass then you do the refactoring over a uh, course of time and then you become uh, when you do frequently refactoring then the the code will become very clean so that it won't give any error so this is a simple life cycle that uh, other has explained with an uh, with uh, some piece of uh, instructions on that uh, book but uh, ideally it all boggled down to one diagram so the first step of test driven is just make sure you write a code which will fail uh, try to fix that code make sure it get passed and it, when it when you say it get passed means it should go into a live state and then you try to improvise on that code Uh, so that it will become very clean and more efficient uh, over a period of uh, one or two months if it is a small piece of code that's what other is suggesting to do test driven development the same thing with extreme programming development also it, it also follows the same pattern but in a different approach in extreme programming and also nowadays uh, agile scrum all those things will always talk about take a small piece within two three weeks time so that you can deliver it a value to the business or a minimal viable product kind of stuff so that's what other is talking about and the finally he is saying that uh, once you done your testing and all make sure that you generate the test data for your code that is nothing but your functionality should match to the contracts that what stanley said in the beginning 
and also the invariables that are happening all these are becomes a property based testing so that you know which properties to test how to test with the test data that you provide to the users uh, the functionality to users and also stay safe out there that means uh, you should be very careful because nowadays uh, hijacking systems is very common uh, that just because developers are very careless in uh, making sure that code is not secured enough uh, that's why the ha hacking is happening and a lot of data breaches is also happening and a lot of millions of dollars is uh, taken out from the uh, from the organizations so that is just because developers are careless not to manage the code in a secured uh, fashion that means the vulnerability or a loophole in your coding that's what um, uh, author is highlighting so to avoid those things author is saying that give least privileges don't give everyone the access or uh, try to deny the access and try to give only the users which are uh, eligible for to view the code and also secure the defaults uh, default values or any other default admin cases for example in your uh, home router uh, is given example that you have a default password the moment you purchase the device try to change the password don't uh, leave it to the default uh, password so that uh, hackers will know because everybody in the world know that there is a default password so don't uh, use those default passwords and try to make it uh, uh, change whenever you log in similarly your google password email passwords also change it every 45 days that's uh, good for everybody and for you also and similarly encrypt the sensitive data if there is any sensitive data in your code make sure that you encrypt it and store it and also don't keep it in the memory sometimes if there is a memory dump your sensitive data can be exposed in your log files or the system uh, uh, logs so that uh, users can read the data from the system so that they can try to hack it and also keep on updating your systems properly so that uh, you will get latest patches into your operating system or your devices so that uh, people will not access the vulnerabilities of the operating systems also and finally the naming conventions so for applications your subsystems modules functions variables whatever you have you are giving a name give a meaningful uh, name because once you move it into the production it is very difficult to rename the uh, variables in the production uh, source code lot of effort is needed to again uh, redo that's why always renaming is harder that's what he's saying so if you are making it a functional uh, which is used by the customers uh, try to use it a meaningful name so that everybody can understand your code so naming will show you the intent and belief how much uh, users can believe your source code or your piece of functionality uh, it depends on the naming convention that uh, you propose to your code so that's it in the chapter that i have so if you have any questions that i can uh, take it forward otherwise we will move to the next uh, chapter okay thank you vijay yeah reading is 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 often uh, under <laughs> underutilized okay next up we have Let's see, we have, uh, who's next? Janice. Yeah, can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Does it still work? Yes, it still works. Okay, awesome. So hi everyone, my name is Janice and I decided to use less text for this particular chapter because um, they are really quite a few i would say not so code related items on this particular chapter so as you can see in this particular meme here it's basically about requirements gathering and you know this guy is cannot he's cannot start his project because there are no requirements and what i got from the book right was that actually sometimes you know what is requirements gathering all about and if you see with me on the next slide Uh, yeah, so our job here right, is to help people understand what they want and in fact that's probably our most valuable attribute. So for some people who are you know, um, technical and they work in a development team and they realize that when they talk to stakeholders they get very frustrated because they don't know what the stakeholders want and then when they st the stakeholders say oh you know I want ABC 
some of these people, I mean, the team will just look at the stakeholders and be like, are you sure you really want APC? So Steve Jobs famously, famously said, people don't know what they want until I tell them. Well, it's not to say that, you know, user research and all is not important, but it's to say that as part of the development team, it's very important that we help the users to go on a journey, on a journey of exploration to understand what they want and to look for all these eight cases and ask them questions to, to really get the answer out. So it's really about you know, exploring with the users, with the clients, exactly what kind of product features they want rather than what they tell you on the get-go. And if we look at the next slide here, sometimes maybe we shouldn't really believe what's on the slides because you know, people who know what they're talking about don't need PowerPoint, but I guess we're not using PowerPoint or using Google Slides, so I still think we know what we're talking about. Just a funny thing over there. And then, so, you know, the previous thing I mentioned was about requirements and how it's an exploration journey is about the feedback that we get from the clients and, and it goes to and fro. But sometimes, you know, after we get the feedback, we start to put ourselves in a box and we will think, okay, you know, um, clients has given us APC, therefore whatever we produce cannot be outside of APC. And, and you know, maybe, a point of innovation will be, okay, we think out of the box. So if the box is A, B, C, we'll think out of the box and say, okay, you know, this is D. Um, it's outside of the box, it's innovative, it's going to solve your problem. What really um, kind of came out to me when I read this chapter was that it's not really about thinking inside the box or outside the box, but sometimes the problem lies in finding the box, identifying the real constraints. So client could have told, I mean, the user could have told you that, okay, you know, I want ABC, ABC is very important to me. But when we think of the problem from first principles or from other perspectives, maybe ABC is not really the real problem. Maybe, you know, the client was just facing a particular symptom of the problem and was very frustrated and wanted to solve ABC. But, you know, actually what he or she wanted was something else altogether. So there was this um, comic that I read here that's quite interesting, you know, it's not just about thinking outside the box, but we can also think, can we go inside the box and try to fit everything inside, you know, this um, constraints? Can we look for other boxes to look for new perspective? Or sometimes we just need to deconstruct the entire box and just throw it out the window and say, hey, you know, why is there a box? We're not even solving the right problem. So it's trying to look at things from different perspectives. So I have a very cryptic picture here of the piano, and I think when I was reading chapter eight, before the project, a lot of things um, were said in the chapter, and, and it's really a very long list. But one very important thing that was mentioned was actually feedback. So, you know, there was a whole chapter on the essence of agility, and, you know, the authors are mentioning that we uncover better ways of developing software by helping, by doing it and helping others do it. And, you know, all this comes through getting feedback and is doing it in small steps, you know, iterations. So the reason why I played, I showed a piano here was I was at a, an Agile course conducted by Bas about two years ago. Bas Bode, who is an Agile coach. So one kind of analogy really stood out to me was because he mentioned that getting feedback and timely feedback is just like playing a piano and hearing the note come back to you straight away. And sometimes we think that, okay, you know, feedback is important, but maybe I'll get the feedback from the users or the clients or even my fellow teammates um, next week or at our quarterly review or maybe even at the annual performance um, review or, or annual product roadmap review. But, you know, I was showing a picture of piano here and it really struck me that a lot of our problems can be solved when we have frequent cycles of feedback. So it doesn't have to be at a quarter, annual, or even bi-annually, but you know, right after everything that we do, we can get feedback. And not just feedback from the users and clients, but feedback from our fellow teammates. And sometimes it's also useful to get feedback from ourselves. So one thing the author mentioned was that, you know, it's not just about making um, good software and working in a software team, but in our own lives, it's about working out where we are, you know, where are we, uh, having self-awareness about where we are currently, and then making the small, smallest meaningful step towards where we want to be. And then the feedback comes when you evaluate where you end up and you fix anything that you broke. So every time you think of a feedback, you just need to think of the piano. If you press on the notes 
and your feedback comes three minutes later, it'll be very hard for you to, you know, master Floral Alice or any other kind of Chopin masterpiece if you cannot hear your feedback immediately. And that's the kind of feedback that we want to get in a Agile team. So one quote that stood out to me with, from the book was that a team that doesn't continuously experiment with their process is not an Agile team. So sometimes when we... <laughs> yeah, Danny says he needs to check on his ear. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it could be either the piano's not working or your ear is not working. So <laughs> it could work both ways. And, and you know, from there, it's really about... Agility is not about doing things faster, but agility is about responding to change and to have feedback loops everywhere, not just in doing software or in our personal lives, but just every single thing that we do, we get feedback loops. And that was one of the biggest things that stood out to me from this particular chapter. So, yes, exactly. Early feedback also helped in learning. So, I think the whole idea of this chapter is that before the project, you want to learn as much as possible about the requirements, about the constraints, about your clients. And all these things will help. It's not about overlearning and spending like, you know, half a year doing requirements gathering, but it's iteratively doing the feedback, I mean, gathering the feedback and then working on something, fixing it along the way. And that's exactly what a job is. And yeah, so I mean, these are some of the main points that I got from chapter eight. And one thing that was really resonating with me was the idea that making software is very related to what we do in our personal lives as well. So sometimes a lot of things that um, is mentioned in the Pragmatic Programmers book right, is very related to how we can apply similar principles to our lives and it's kind of intertwined. So when I mentioned, you know, the whole idea of uh, gathering feedback, how do you gather requirements to know what to do next, to do it in small steps. And then the whole idea of you know, thinking outside of the box, but not just that, questioning the box that you have put yourself in and to see, okay, is this really the right problem we're solving? What is the value that we're bringing to the client? And I think that's very related to, to our personal lives as well. When we do something, you know, like, uh, is this really the problem that we want to solve? Is this really the thing that we want to work on? And the last thing is, yeah, you know, getting feedback from people or anything when we do something. So after this, I'll ask you all for feedback and hopefully if you have time, you can just give me some feedback on how this talk was for you and whether it's useful. So one thing that I was reading recently in a book that was written by a Facebook product manager called Julie Jo, she mentioned that one way to learn the fastest is to always ask for feedback. And also to be, you know, um, kind of fair to the people they're asking feedback from, you also have to give feedback, lah, right? It's a two ways kind of communication. So I hope that was helpful for everyone here. We can have a conversation on how to give feedback if that's something that's interesting to all of you. Cool, I think that's the end of my sharing. Any questions? There's no questions in the group chat yet. So thank you, okay. Janice. Yeah, let's, you. Malik, over to you. Hi everyone. Hey. So yeah, I'll be covering chapter nine. So, you know, um, the earlier philosophies uh, and chapters, they really talk about what, uh, they really work on the individual level. And the, good, the great thing about this book is that whatever content that we've covered in the former chapters, they can also be applied at a team level. And for them, once you have more than one person, it's already starting to look at what are some of the rules, ground rules um, that you want to put in place to have this team perform. So uh, the first part of chapter nine really looks at like what are some of the philosophies behind pragmatic teams. Now, there are quite a few philosophies. Some of them you can see are probably like... Um, uh, Old, like concepts from the early chapters rehashed to fit the team concept. But I mean, I'll just go through some of the highlights that really resonated with me. So firstly, scheduling knowledge portfolio. So at the individual level, that's quite clear, you know, on like yearly, you want to pick up a new programming language. Monthly, you want to uh, go in and really deep dive into a technical book. And that's quite clear. At the individual level, you have your own schedule, you have full control over it, and that's how you're going to proceed with it. But now, when you talk at the team level, how is that going to work? First, it has to start off with you being intentional. You know, you know I'll work on this, we'll spike on this, when uh, we'll explore this new concept when we have the time, simply doesn't work anymore. It's really about what, where can you put in that time to make it work to explore these new things. So say, for example, you, know, uh, you find like there are some 
uh, parts of the code that don't work. And it's been something that's in part of your tech, tech debt for quite a while. Scheduling time for it is going to add is going to be the only way you're going to forward that uh, debt and, you know, really improve on it. Um, another thing is, you know, like, it can get a bit monotonous, for example, if, let's say, uh, the teams get into the zone of just, you know, uh, developing features of the features, and, you know, it's really, there are some things that they want to try spike and explore. Even things like that require time and effort. Now, of course, um, just to share a bit of experience from my projects team, um, the tech leads, usually work to the developers to collate what some of the things that they want to take a look at. And, you know, it's about balancing the interest between the business side and the tech side. You know, of course, business would like to have you churn features nonstop. But at the same time, as a techie, there's some things you want to explore, things that are slightly outside of whatever you're doing right now that can actually impact the project or even things that are completely out of it. So it's really about balancing those needs. So the, once the tech lead kind of gets the requirements on the things they want to explore, one of the things that we kind of have to fulfill on is like, how is this going to forward the project? You know, um, uh, it could be justifying that, you know, we normally take this long for working on this specific feature and just to future proof it or just to add a new feature, to make it easier to add a new feature. Uh, this is something worthwhile exploring. So it's really about how you're going to justify it and angle it. Another thing that my team once did and this is only possible with senior management's um, support is, you know, like having hackathons. So uh, the hackathon topics can be things pertaining to your project, you know, like features that we've thought about exploring but are not in the pipeline currently or exploring new libraries, you know, like we've always been working on this library, for example. Um, how will our implementation look like with another library? So that's something that, you know, we can like take a look at. But of course, this requires senior management approvals and someone who's well-versed in uh, like really getting the business side to see the value of doing this. So that's for number one. Uh, number two, communicating the team presence. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you're more than just like a cog within the whole like machinery. Uh, your team has a distinct identity and you want to build on an identity because you don't, you don't want it to be the case where your team is dragging their feet to the meeting you know, uh, it, you know, to put it colloquially, it's like very CNs, for example. And it's about what, you know, it's like, say, for example, when you go to Netflix, when you go to Google, when you go to Spotify, you know that their team has a brand and what makes their team stand out. So what is your team's brand? What is the team presence that you wish to communicate? And, you know, that is something that you want to look at to uh, really have your team be motivated in that sense. So that's for number two. Uh, number three, uh, tracer bullets. So like Stanley was mentioning, ultimately it's about getting like feedback quicker. And in the team context, you know, we have different activities to like designing the, uh, architecting the solution, designing the uh, respective feature, you know, and testing it, so on and so forth. A common misconception is that these things can happen in isolation. And that's not often true the impact of, you know, viewing these items as separate, say, for example, the most uh, popular one, like QE and development, is that you have like gates and handoffs. So what the book recommends in this case is having uh, one, a more holistic skill set, that's one, and two, developing based on the feature, meaning you own end-to-end -end the process of developing that feature. So uh, our team took up part of that in terms of uh, how can we own a feature end to end. So there'll be uh, smaller groups called feature, like a feature squad, and they are the ones driving a specific feature. So from the onset of architecting, where they will clear the tech lead, all the way to the uh, design of the feature, where they work with the, uh, the UX and the business analysts, all the way to the development, and to some parts of testing, that's, uh, that's how we kind of take part in this specific uh, portion almost end to end. So just to be fully transparent, we also still have a QE, but where we kind of get more involved in the, the testing bit is where we discuss with the QEs what are some of the acceptance criteria, some of the things that we can be responsible for within our code and then uh, uh, create those tests. So that's for respective um, the point number three. So next one. Yeah. So uh, so that's kind of like the philosophy guiding the team. So uh, one point that the, uh, in chapter nine that really stood out, right, is that 
you know, once you have your team set up, you have some of the ground rules set up, uh, even in mature teams, there's always a tendency to go, you know, what are the big companies doing? What's GitLab doing? What's Spotify doing? What's Netflix doing? What's Google doing? And, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But at the end of the day, it's all about context. Context is decisive. You know, what works for your team may not work for, uh, what works for Netflix, for example, may not work for your team. And that's one of the pitfalls that uh, pragmatic teams should be wary of. So, you know, here, like they mentioned, the cargo cult idea is that, uh, you know, like in certain parts of uh, New, uh, New Guinea and Melanesia, if I'm not wrong, uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a plane from like the Western part of the world, like America, for example, that came over and then they brought in like uh, goods, wealth and some prosperity. Then after they left, the locals over there created a plane made out of wood in hopes that it would replicate the success. And how, and this is something that even people in the tech side can replicate. So say, for example, when you decided to con Scrum, you know, one funny example that stood out for me is that, you know, they've observed people who take on Scrum, that do daily Scrum every Friday. <laughs> so, you know, it's, while they have the, the visible artifact over there, you know, they're not exactly reaping the benefit and it becomes more, uh, ornamental in terms of the process itself. So that's basically what it's uh, like to be part of technology cargo cult. So with that being said, then ultimately, what's the real goal here? You want to reduce the time it takes to deliver on a feature. If you're delivering features in years, what can you do to deliver, uh, change it to months, weeks? And if you're doing it weeks, what can you do to, to uh, like hasten the delivery to within hours? Ultimately, it's about getting value out to people. And that's where, the, where you should anchor yourself when you're considering certain like, uh, practices or uh, processes. So that's uh, in terms of what's the real goal out here. Now, I mean, then at the end of it, it becomes very simple. You know, do what works for your team. You know, uh, and the only way is to try. If it doesn't work, then remove it. Try. If some parts of it work, some parts of it don't, then take the parts that don't, uh, that, that work, and then just let go of the parts that don't work. And it's ironic because, not ironic, uh, rather uh, interesting, because this book itself advocates that, you know, even the things that he shares in this book, it's ultimately up to you to try it and assess whether it works for your team. So it's not like a religious kind of book where, you know, you're supposed to adopt the practices wholesale. So that's for um, the aspect of how do you avoid being part of a technology cargo cult. So now that, you know, you've got the ground rules, you've got like the, the things to be wary and mindful of as you are embarking on your project, uh, the pragmatic uh, programmer guide has this thing called a pragmatic starter kit. Now, this is not exactly a new concept, so I'll kind of go through this quite quickly. So the three minimum things for the starter kit is that there's version control to drive tests, builds, and releases. At the end of the day, you don't want to have like a special machine, and that machine is the one that contains the source of truth because people start to tiptoe around it. People will start to be nervous when they make changes to it. Um, quite frankly, I can't imagine a world where we don't have version control at the moment. So this is just something that's part of the base uh, starter kit. Um, next part is uh, having regression testing. Uh, and you know, you, know, you want to test early, test often, and test automatically. So, you know, your unit test, your integration test, your load test. Um, there's other assortments of tests that the book mentions. But, you know, at the end of the day, I want to find bugs now. I want to, whatever bugs that, that's discovered, I want to capture it, have a test for it, and ensure that that specific bug doesn't happen again. It's about feedback, ultimately. And then lastly, I don't think we need to talk about automation. You know, just people aren't as repeatable or... Uh, in my opinion, reliable as computers. So automation is going to be key here. When you're deploying something to the cloud, uh, deploying something into uh, where you're storing like an artifact or whatnot into your ECR, et cetera, you know, that's basically where automation is key. And even if you have one step that's manual, that's uh, what they call uh, resulting in a broken window and, you know, you're breaking the pipeline, so to speak. So that's for the pragmatic uh, starter kit. 
So then next, so when you have the pragmatic starter kit, right? Ultimately, why do you want to have this? It's to really forward the goal of delighting people, delighting your users. Now, I do uh, admit this point does seem a bit fluffy, but really at the end of the day, it's about where you anchor yourself when you're doing software engineering. Of course, there are different motivations like money, like for example, furthering your own curiosity in terms of whatever you're out to build. But when you anchor yourself out there, you're going to be starting to look at what success looks like for that person. And that's going to really be the key that's driving your product forward. So that's what delighting users is in a nutshell. So lastly, uh, the book ended off the chapter nine and therefore, you know, kind of like the whole book with this chapter called Pride and Prejudice. So, you know, uh, ownership. So ownership, there's a, there's a line to it, right? You know, so if you go too far too much to the left, you go incognito, you don't know who is the one that worked on this specific feature, you don't know who is the one that did this specific uh, class, etc. cetera. Um, you know, there's gonna be a risk of one, uh, sloppiness, uh, a lot of erroneous codes and really just gonna slow down the delivery time because why no one's taking ownership for it. It's not coming from a place where yes, this is my code and I can defend it. Uh, and it's, it's going to be harder to catch people, quote unquote, catch people uh, when let's say they make this kind of error and correct those behaviors. So that's if let's say there's zero ownership. On the opposite end, there's something called too much ownership. You know, like Golem and the ring, you know, uh, it's going to result in people being very defensive. People not wanting to collaborate with other people people not wanting to reuse features or create reusable features because why the incentive here is wrong and really anchored to the individual level as opposed to the team level. So that's the, on the opposite end of uh, not owning it and you result in too much uh, ownership, self-ownership in that sense. So what's the kind of like the sweet spot? So the sweet spot here is really looking at reducing the degree of the anonymity so when you talk about like a uh, bus factor, you know, if these few teammates of mine, you know, got hit by a bus, touch wood, um, you know, can we still understand the code? Can we still proceed on with developing uh, this specific feature or this product, so to speak? And we want to gradually shift it to a place where people own the code together. So it can move away from uh, it should move away from like, oh, I didn't work on that feature, but I do notice that there's a bug there. You know, let's see what I can do to solve this problem. So that's like, you know, kind of looking at it from a shared ownership perspective. And lastly, you know, as a software engineer, you want to be able to say, hey, I wrote this and I can stand behind my work. You know, I put the thought, the effort, and you know, I've already done whatever I, I can to fulfill or whatever is necessary and possibly beyond that I can stand behind my work. So that's kind of the fine line, you know, the sweet spot for um, ownership. And the, the book ended itself off by saying, you know, you know, you can have different titles like coder, programmer, software engineer, but at the end of the day, from the book's perspective, we are all problem solvers. So that's where, that's kind of like the hat that we, we should be putting on when it comes to approaching uh, software engineering. So that's all for my chapter.